Let me start with a story. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Three years ago or so, maybe two and a half years ago mm. to be exact, early 2021, I'm minding my own business at Beit al kataib at the Pierre Jmeil anniversary. They were inaugurating the statue that's there right now in Saifi. I was invited to sit down. I was alone, minding my own business. I go up to say hello to Sami Jmeil. I go up to say hello to Amin Jmeil. And behind the Jmeil family is this character <laughs> who's like waving, you know? And I can't really tell who he's looking at. He's waving at me. And I'm trying to be diplomatic with the former president and the future president. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> future, future president. <laughs> so, <laughs> All matter nights getting in line. <laughs> yeah. Actually, my favorite question is, who is Michel Maud? <laughs> I've done that twice already tonight. So I'm there. And this larger-than-life character wants to get my attention. I larger. Turn, I, <laughs> I turn around to avoid him. And I start to leave. And I don't know if he's here yet. Paco, Patrick Risha, I don't think he's here yet. Mm -mm. He sees me leaving and he grabs me. And he says, you have to meet George Wardini. I'm like, who the hell is George Wardini? And I look back and it's him waving still. So I'm like, okay, I guess this, uh, I have to meet this man. He comes up to me and tells me, this. I swear to God, this is true. I want you to host a show for me. <laughs> I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Who are you? He said, I have an idea. And he has many ideas, by the way. And he says, I want your number. And we will talk later. And I turned to Patrick. I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> trust me, trust me. Give him your number. A few days later, this gentleman here calls me. I have another idea. <laughs> I want you to host a show. Not this one, another one. And I'm like, listen, let's just meet in person, get to know each other better before I start working for you. And I met him, I think, the same evening with a few other people, maybe one mutual friend. And I listened to him pitch me an idea. And it sounded terrific. And I actually gave him the name for, that, for the show. Mm -hmm. And I was about to be the host. I think it's George Verdini's uh, claim to fame. It's called Seha, The Square. Now, this show had two seasons. If anyone doesn't know it, check it out, because that's what George Bardini can do. He can pin you with an idea and then make it happen. And I don't think many people know that you're the producer. You're behind the scenes. Yeah. Okay. So then I kind of got a hint for his tone. I start getting messages from an Instagram page called Polyblog. <laughs> and I could swear this is, it's George Bardini. So I message, I'm like, are you the same guy that's hosting a seha? He's like, what made you think so? <laughs> I, I have to interrupt and say this is more exaggerated than a Netflix documentary. This, by is, the way. <laughs> this is exactly what happened. And he said, I want to collaborate with you. I'm like, I called George. I'm like, George, are you Polyblock? He said, maybe. <laughs> My best collaboration that I've had on Instagram is with this guy, George Verdine. It's Polyblog and the Beirut Banyan talking about May 7, 2008. I couldn't have done it without him. He put it together. He gave me the pitch. I sat down. I let him do his magic. I should note, this is a podcast that has been going on for five years. Zaven is here. Zaven? Where is Zaven? Hey. Hey, Zaven. He's already... By the way, Zaven is the host of Aseha. Now he's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, bye. <laughs> Come on in. He's the host of Seha, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where I forgot where we were. Oh, yeah. Uh, Polyblog, Bayoud Banyan. Yes, two years later, though. Oh, yo, sorry. This podcast, I've been doing it for five years. I've done episodes with many people in the audience. It's not the most well-known podcast, obviously. There's Serde. This guy produced Serde for two months. And in terms of digital content, content creation, teaching me about social media, teaching me about narrative, about insights, about how to use Instagram better, there's no one else but George Verdini. 
So we're going to get into a lot of difficult terrain tonight, but mm -hmm. let's start with a round of applause for Georges Verdini. Thank you. This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatar, and this is The Beirut Banyan. George Wardini is an architect. He's supposed to be doing architecture and design. Instead, he's harassing us with politics all the time. <laughs> so let me start it here. What made you leave a career in architecture mm -hmm. to become a social media digital content creator? I, uh, wow, uh, I was, uh, Awashi, thank you for this amazing introduction. Lies, all of it, but okay. It's all true, it's all true. <laughs> Uh, I remember, I think, I think coincidence played a big role. I was graduating uh, art school from the Lebanese University uh, in Fournishabek around the time where the country was starting to, uh, uh, yani 2019 was starting to unfold. And I had been uh, in school, I entered school very late. I started university when I was 23. And I've been, uh, I've, I surprised myself that I was even interested in politics to begin with. I've always been very anti uh, everything establishment, whether it was politics, political parties, religious institutions. I never thought I'd even go in this direction. And um, something happened back then, and it was right after the trash crisis was, uh, was unfolding. And I, I, for some reason, I found myself really attracted to activism. And it was the wrong place and the wrong crowd because art school is full of people who think that they're cooler than everything, uh, including politics. And I was the I was the person trying to get everybody to join certain protests. We could, back then, we had the tax cuts and stuff like this, and uh, nobody was even interested. And actually, people who who were interested were totally, yeah, totally silenced. I would say. And then 2019 happened, and it was my last year in school and uh, in art school. And uh, suddenly everybody became interested. There was a very, very sudden spike of interest in politics and people who had no previous knowledge whatsoever. And that's, we'll get into that a bit later. And it was this small campus of 600 uh, students and uh, after, after spending three years you know, trying uh, and failing to get people interested, I was uh, helping uh, other activists in the university lead marches, and at some point we were about 200 people walking from the university down to downtown. So, and it was then when I started to really feel like um, I had a lot of opinions about what was going on, and uh, I, I felt like there was a lot of things that we were doing not in an ideal way. I felt there was a lot of uh, yeah, different messaging that confused people. And I'm talking, when I talk about messaging, I'm talking about the, the crowd that was back then what we call it the Thawra, before it even turned into a political scene and alternative parties and organizations. It was still a very loose uh, scene of people. And we had a lot of momentum and then we suddenly started to lose it because we were shooting ourselves in the foot. And I, uh, I remember I, had a lot, I, I, I was very bored and I had a lot of free time. So I wrote a problem statement of what I thought was the problem. And I started going to people that I felt could help me create a solution. And that's how I got, uh, I got drawn into, I got sucked into politics basically. Eight months before the elections, I quit my job in architecture and I became full-time whatever it is that I do today. <laughs> So let me try to explain a bit of how I see George Wardini. I see him still as an architect. Uh, I've watched this guy, and let me, let me, let me try to explain you mm -hmm. in a way that's just. Okay, but turn off my microphone, because I'll be <laughs> impulsive. Yeah. This guy can be wearing sunglasses at three in the morning, uh, drinking a martini. They're prescription, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> they are, I swear. <laughs> dressed up for a night out at some horrible club like recess or ufo mm -hmm. or whatever <laughs> on his way back he has his laptop open and he's doing an instagram post 
And it's not a normal Instagram post. I use Instagram. I depend on my phone. I use my phone. George Wardini has this little laptop. I don't know if it's with you tonight. Not tonight. Not tonight. He does these designs. It's not normal. It's actually, it's, it's so talented. Thank you. And you use, I think, you, you taught me how to use Instagram. And I think that's more design than social media. So is that you taking architecture and throwing it in? Uh, my background in architecture definitely played a role, but I, I would call it uh, I would call it part of the communi- This is visual communication to me, and it, it goes along with the storytelling, with the with the actual content itself. And it's, I think it's a selling point because it's uh, very hard to compete for attention of people who are on a entertainment first platform and get them to read, um, yani hard opinions on things that they're not here for. So I think part of the the packaging is very important. Because we're trying to catch people off guard, basically. It's an entertainment platform. It's not Twitter. It's uh, it's Instagram. And back then, even Instagram was, wasn't as politicized. I remember there was a point where there was only one political uh, Instagram, uh, you know, Instagram account. And uh, it was a much smaller scene. So, yes, I, be, I, I really believe, yes, architecture did play, a, did play a, um, a role. Like, design thinking plays a role. But it's more about visual communication. So we'll get into social media later because yeah. there's a lot of terrain there yeah. and why you use why you turn to social media for politics and mm. political expression. But before we go there, uh, there is somebody in the audience tonight, Naila Al Khuri. I don't know where she is. There she is. Okay. Hi, Naila. A check out her podcast. It's called Poly Talks. I think I was a guest on season one, and the first season was audio only, and on my first three years were audio only too. Yep. So both of us were doing audio episodes, and then season two is video, and it's high quality video. And I actually inquired, I'm like, who's producing this? It's George Wardini, <laughs> behind the scenes. So you have a talent, not just for social media, but you have an eye for video. And I think the reason Polytox is such a pleasure to watch, it's because you're making it pleasurable. So does that come? Save it quickly, Ronnie. <laughs> I actually told her before you're allowed to interrupt this episode. So yes, it's it's you too. Yes, a round of applause to Nail Al Khuri. <laughs> Hold on, but he left a very you left a very important piece of information. Let about me plug. Nailah. Let me plug. Beit Dean Festival, Chicago, Arabia. If you haven't checked it out, watch it. The, it's next week. Next week. Are there any seats left? Oh, it's so, really. Uh, be. Tell her you like watching her and she'll give you a free seat. <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> I think. Anyway. <clears throat> okay, so you, you have a talent to actually, it's almost like a television quality podcast. So that, back, See? <laughs> that, that background, that, where does that come from? Because that's not architecture or social media design. You actually, you have an eye for what's digestible. I think that's design. Design is all about having an eye. And I don't think when you, if you, it takes a lot for someone to call themselves an artist. But if you've been through art school, you learn a lot of things uh, that are not just directly related to what you do. Architecture uh, is, you know, it requires people to have a lot of talents or to grow a lot of talents because it's so many things in one. So I think uh, the kind of design thinking that, uh, and mind you, the Lebanese University is a very top-notch, I mean, it's, you know, people who graduate from, from the Lebanese University, they're always the first to get picked for a job. Um, we took courses in uh, cinematography, we took courses in dance, we took courses in Photoshop. So I think a lot of what I've acquired in terms of um, design thinking or having an artistic or detail-oriented eye, I think it comes from that. And of course, I mean, I mean of course, I've, I've always, you know, people always know I was gonna go into architecture because ever since I was a little kid, I would just, people would just hand me like, my mom would just need to get me to shut up or something. She would just hand me a, uh, a piece of paper and a pen and I would just draw buildings. And I would like draw some, then I learned how to draw in three dimensions. So uh, when I was 15, I even stopped school. I started going to technical school for architecture, which was odd back then because people assumed that if you go to technical school, it means you failed in, in the academic course. Uh, so I've, I've, I've known ever since, uh, I've been directed towards architecture, and I've always had a sense of 
design thinking or an eye for design. I think with the academic background that we got, I think it grew. But all of this I would put under this, the one umbrella, which is, which is I think, um, it's what you would call art. Art. Yeah. So let me ask one more question about this before we get into Please. news and media and narrative. Yeah. Uh, if you're calling that art, how do you pull off a multi-camera production on the spot? I don't think art can actually... I have no idea. So, and <laughs> this is, by the way, you've told me before. Yeah, I've told that, you story. Yeah, that in a way, without realizing it, you're arranging a canceled location and rearranging a new shot mm. and getting everyone ready and audio and so visual. Hectic. So yeah. let, let me introduce it and you can, you can okay. pick up. Okay. This is for a Seha season two. If I'm not yeah. mistaken, or yeah. Se- yeah, season two. No, but it starts, I'll tell you, okay. But he, this guy gets notified that the location is canceled. No, we cancel it. Oh, sorry. Oh, we only got to visit, uh, it was, it was, we were supposed to film an episode in uh, the Hamra Theater. Um, Masrah al Madini. Masrah al Madini. Yeah. And I go, and it's one day before, because we didn't have time to scout, we were shooting two episodes in the same day. And I look around, and it's the most... I mean, I don't want to, yeah, the location they gave us, there are a lot of beautiful spots there, but they were all booked. And the location they gave us is just completely problematic. There's no way I could shoot there. And it was almost at 8 p.m. And the episode uh, included guests from Amnesty International and uh, the Beirut Bar Association. So I, yeah, it had to be really perfect. And it was about the port blast. So I was with uh, Alexi Shadye, who's a very talented uh, director. Uh, shout out to Alexi if he's watching. And... Uh, I told them we need to go find another location, and this was less than 12 hours before the actual episode. So at 8 at night, yeah. you're rearranging the next morning's location yes. and, and everything. Yes. So, and then you make it happen. So I don't know how. It was crazy. We, we, uh, it was at night. We went to the port. We, I really wanted to do something right in front of the port because it would be so symbolic. But the highway stretch has no extra stand. It must be any kind of pavement that we could use. And un- other than this Timsel uh, al yeah, which has a very oddly shaped uh, pavement. And it would be really difficult to like arrange a circular... Uh, uh, set with enough margins for the cameraman and I insisted I was like Alexi is like resisting is like no this is risky. Like, I insist this is the location we're going to shoot and by some miracle we actually pull it off and we were able to get a permit only 30 minutes before the start of the episode because had we not gotten the permit because we're now we're shooting in a public space uh they could have easily, like the, uh, the state could have easily st- and stopped us from shooting. It would have been a disaster. So it, we took a huge risk. So it's a timely episode since August 4 is approaching next Friday. I would recommend watching it. It's largely about post-Port Blast impunity. Um, I, I don't remember which number it is, but it's season two. It's maybe the third episode or so, perhaps. It's, it's the fifth episode. So fifth episode. Yeah. Watch it because what you're watching is a last-minute decision by Georges Verdini. And by the way, the trailer which is incredible, is you can see him by accident. He's there. He's not supposed to be there. It's a drone shot coming out from nowhere, highway traffic, and then four or five people are seated yeah. in the middle of the highway, and in the corner is George Verdini making sure everything is fine with your sunglasses on yeah. <laughs> at 9 or 10 in the morning. <laughs> one, 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Yes. Okay, but I mean, it's within hours that yeah. you make something like that happen. I think that's your gift, more than art and more than social media, which we're going to jump into, I think it's your determination. You kind of know what you want, and then you come and get it. I was going to say, bless you. Yes. Oh, you should be listening. <laughs> I'm complimenting you. Yes, Listen yes. To I'm me. deflecting. I'm, I'm, I'm here. deflecting. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be mean to you later. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> no, but it, it's, that's your gift, in my opinion. Thank you. But let's go away from that and into something I think you're best known for because you came out of the closet, if you will. Uh, this guy is... He's Polly Blog. Polyblog, <laughs> yes. He came out of the digital media closet. Yeah. Uh, Polyblog. So if you don't know it, check it out. It's an Instagram feed. And I think it's something like two or three people that are involved at any point. We're five now. You're five. We're five. Two of them are here. They're amazing. Sara and Misha. So that, that's Sara Asmar. Where is Sara? She's co-hosting with me a mini series called Gen X Z. I know her in large part thanks to George Verdini, although we communicated before that. But it's George Bardini's tip that brought me to Sara. And Misha, where's Misha? Okay, so you joined recently, yeah, Polyblog? 
How much is he paying you? <laughs> Don't go there. Misha is the social media uh, producer for Albert's uh, 2030 on LBC. Oh. Yep. Look at you, George Wardini. Now you're taking Albert's talent. Watch out. <laughs> Watch out, Be Albert. Be careful. <laughs> so that's, that's your eye. You know to pick the right people for the right job. And Polyblog is not you or Sara or Misha. It's just posts. And sometimes you have sort of guest authors and the like. But I think it's kind of the spirit of what you want delivered in Lebanon. And I think it's the spirit of reform on one side and on the other, individual liberty. Yeah. And it's not news for the sake of news. It's actually no. opinion based. Yep. There is at times just digital reporting. Yeah. But that's not the emphasis. No. So let's get into Polyblog. Yes. Yeah. First, what made you come up with this idea? I know mm. that you're a co-founder. What made you get into Instagram for news? And why do you think media is the right way to deliver politics? I want to go back to the context. This was at a time where, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the political landscape was still forming and it was a, it was a very uh, loose, loosely put together uh, group of activists and people. And you know, at the early stages of the Thawra, there was this sort of uh, uh, Thawra people are always presumed that they act together and they don't, you know, they don't attack each other. Oh, I know who this is. Hold on. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> so so there was the sense of uh, that Thawra people don't don't speak badly about each other. But there was this kind of image of unison and cohesion, and everybody was on the same page. And slowly, slowly, there was divisions that started to appear through the cracks. And when this started to happen, I think this is when we started to shoot ourselves in the foot. And it was a lot of uh, contradicting messaging. It was a lot of. Uh, Confusing messaging. Uh, people started to to real. The people on the streets started to realize that there's no actual targeted uh, uh, leadership. Uh, most of these people have no idea what they're doing, and this is when things started to fall apart. And I believe that, uh, you know, my my contribution back then was to try to set up a voice online that tries to be responsible and tries to inject some sort of mature thinking uh, into this noise. And this is how the idea really started. And it was is, really is, a reactionary is, yeah. response. To what? I know that you've said this to, before. To a lot of chaos and a lot of uh, bad communication or ineffective communication. Mm. Not that I had, initially I had no idea what I was doing. This was, I was still doing you know, architecture most of the day and uh, I was creating posts in between breaks and it was the very, very early stage. Um, and th so this was this was the the reason why we created the platform because I felt like uh, I also felt like a lot of people were told that they're not allowed to have a voice because there was this sort of uh, purity that had to be met by whoever had an opinion. Yani, if you ha if you had been an activist in any sort of political organization or party prior to 2019, then you're shunned away. And I felt like I deserved to have a voice to have a voice. But this is why also in the initial stages of the, of the platform, I, tr I, I chose not to put a name or face to it because mm. I didn't want it to be about uh, the person writing the content. I wanted it to be about the content itself. Uh, and then with time, I felt like the context has completely changed and it was the right time for me to slowly uh, come out. <laughs> And uh, and so so this is this is how the you know, the transition from being totally anonymous. And by the way, I've I've realized that a lot of platforms started off like this. I I heard John Asir once talk about how in the beginning of Megaphone, uh, it was uh, uh, you know, nobody signed their names. Yep. It was totally uh, anonymous. So I understand why because there's always also the security concern. Um, not that I think any of us are that relevant, but still you you don't want to be harassed. Uh, and then there's also the uh, there was a point in the in the protest that there was a lot of uh, I would say uh, character assassination for people. Uh, people were taking each other down left and right for nothing because I felt like uh, I feel like now because uh, they felt like po they felt powerless towards the state, so they started attacking each other. They they picked on people their own size, which is very sad. But that's in the past now. So you saw this Instagram page as a way of bringing diverging views from October 17 together. 
Yes, and the... introducing uh, introducing uh, you know, having uh, putting a voice to opinions that were really shunned, which 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 uh, what I would describe as simply pragmatic views, mm. you know, which was very far removed from all the idealism and the purity that we all really struggled with at some point. So I think. G- give me an example of that. Is that meaning you didn't want to be seen as a typical left wing blogger? Or a typical right wing. I, I think in the initial stages of digital media, even worldwide, not just in Lebanon, it was very left uh, dominated. And I think because uh, media institutions, traditional media institutions, were owned by uh, yeah, people with generational wealth, they required hundreds of millions of dollars to operate. And then uh, digital media democratized. Uh, Uh, this process and it allowed anybody with any sort of device to have their own voice and this is why I think the left jumped on the opportunity of weaponizing social media and then the right figured out that there's this new terrain and they caught on to it this is on a global scale uh, in Lebanon but you, but you don't think of yourself as that not no, as the right looking no, at the left no 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 not at all I think a lot of people sometimes get confused with the messaging of polyblog because they see very uh, sovereignist right-wing nationalist post, but then we're putting the pride flag and they're like, hold on, we can't put you in a box. And yeah, the point is for you not to be able to put us in a box. We take away what we believe is best from every every single uh, discourse and idea. And I think it's very important to merge, um, uh, to merge this uh, Lebanese first discourse with a liberal progressive uh, rhetoric. I think this is the really the unique thing that we do. So as much as you'd like to say about this subject, yep. what made you formulate your political opinions and reach that conclusion mm. early on in life? Because you're young, mm. you're, you're much younger during the You Stink protests, mm-hmm. which you mentioned earlier. Yep. You're still in your 20s. so Only two months to go. Two months to go? Yeah. Fine. Holding on to your 20s. <laughs> but for since the October 17 uprising, yeah, you've been 26. in your 20s. Yeah, yeah. So you're young mm. and you've come to conclusions quickly. Mm. Is there anything in your background that makes you feel that you're in that position within October 17? I think it's a reflection of um, no. I mean, I mean, I don't think opinions. Uh, I don't think uh, pe- people who hold opinions because uh, uh, you're an architect as a student. Yeah, yeah. That's not political. You're not studying this. No, field. no, no, no. So why do you have these certain angled thoughts without without even without addressing it? In any way, you kind of come to a conclusion quickly. I mean, maybe it looks quickly, but it's not. Uh, and three, I think three years since we've begun, I think opinions have evolved. Everybody's opinions and views have evolved a lot in the last three years. Mm. Uh, mine included, uh, I'm not coming to any sort of concrete conclusion. This is just uh, how I see things from my perspective, from my social background, from my own personal struggles as a citizen and what I would like to, to see in order to feel represented. So I'm doing what I, what I feel is uh, my, a representation of my ideas, but I don't claim that uh, I have rigid conclusions mm. and I, I'm still open to evolving ideas all the time. Um, so yeah, I don't know if this answers your question, but it's not, it's not, a, it's not, it's not something that uh, has been constant for three years. It's something that's been constantly moving. And I think it will continue to move. But uh, being drawn to politics, which is the larger part of your question, I don't understand this about me. I've always thought I'd end up being a artist with blue hair, whatever. <laughs> now I'm an, a politician with barely any hair. <laughs> so uh, I've always, you know, I've never seen myself doing this. And then it happened in the moment and I was completely drawn into it and I have no idea why. Well, let me pitch an idea and you can take what you want from it. Okay. And I, I do scan the posts daily. Mm. And there's, in addition to what I said earlier, which is there's this almost a reform-driven mm. aspect, but there's also liberties. Mm. And within liberties, there's a defense. Mm. And it's almost every day, mm. if not every day sometimes, defending marginalized communities. Mm. So let's start there and then we can go to other posts. Yeah, that's very close to home. There's something you posted, I think, yesterday. Yeah. Uh, or... Two days, uh, just yesterday, actually. There were several posts yesterday. It was yesterday, right? Right. So if you can, if anyone's on Instagram right now, look up Polyblog. And you were really going after Hassan Nasrallah. Mm -hmm. And you made it very digital friendly. And you were, in a way, deeply condemning Hezbollah's uh, 
song and dance with Jnoud al Rab. In that it's almost that they wanted to catch up <laughs> and yeah. be as homophobic yeah. as the homophobes of yeah. Lebanon. And you were very quick to respond. Yeah. So take me into the thought process of one thing. Going down that road, which is not easy. Mm. Even though a lot of us talk about Hezbollah, you made it personal. And the second thing is that... No, they made it personal. Fair enough. Okay. And that you're using something which is monitored. Mm. Social media is not off limits. Right. People get interrogated. People get summoned for Instagram posts. You're doing it more and more. And we know that it's you. Mm. So where does that come from? The confidence and willingness to go after someone like Hassan Nasrallah directly. Uh, I think some of us are a bit more privileged in, in feeling like they have more margins of liberties than others. Maybe because I live you know, in, a, in an area where I feel protected. Um, maybe because I don't feel immediate threat. Uh, I've, got, I've got a response. Uh, I posted a story on my personal account two days ago. And it says, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a quote by Martin Luther King where he says, at the end we will not remember the words of our enemies but the silence of our friends. And I said that people need to start speaking up now. Now is the time. Now. So somebody replied to me and uh, asked, uh, how, do you, how would you advise somebody who's queer and in the closet to start speaking up? And I realized that not everybody has the same uh, privileges and liberties. Some people are actually afraid because they feel threatened. So I feel like, to answer your first question, I feel like I have, it, I have a bit more of a margin of liberty, but I know we're all uh, within reach easily. I mean, Hariri had a $1 billion security team, and we've seen how. So I think we've all within reach. Uh, I honestly don't care. I think the, it's just about not caring. But why, why going, you know, the first part of your question. Unlike other posts, yeah. which are, they tend to be, the, the tone is a little different for the most part, not always. But this one seemed to be more, I know, I'm, I'm going... It, 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 it was a, it was a, it's, it's a political post because I think first and foremost what Nasrallah is trying to do is to divert attention away by trying to put the narrative somewhere else. So the decision we took is to put uh, his narrative vis-a-vis what he's actually uh, accusing, you know, what he's actually done. And we asked people, who do you think is the real threat? Because we wanted to remind people that this guy is trying, oh, Najat is here. Najat Saliba, round Thank of applause so for, for Najat Saliba. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I, I, messaged, I messaged Najat two hours ago, and I told her, I know this is a stretch. But if you have nothing better to do, we're filming an episode, and it would mean a lot if you came. She kicked Milham in the <laughs> said, I'm out. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Uh, where were we? Let me, I'll, I'll segue back. Okay. Let, me, let me just quickly bring Please. this to life. I'm walking with George Berdini at something like 11.30 p.m., mm. and we both run into Najat Saliba going to the parliament. She invited us. She let us walk with her. That was their first introduction. Yeah. So yeah, that, no, I've met Najad before during. Uh, it was a real. It was a proper hello. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it yeah. was the first. Uh, so going back to the. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make many jokes there, but I decided yeah. not to. Yes. <laughs> cut, cut. No, let's go back to the aggressive tone, and you said. Two things. That you I feel? don't think our tone was aggressive. I think our tone was uh, reciprocating what Hassan Nasrallah said. He is trying to uh, يعني, enact the Sharia law on Lebanese. First of all, this is extremely rejected. And I have a problem with that. I also have a problem with people saying, no, no, he's just addressing the gays in his community as if they're his property and he's free to do whatever he wants to them. Uh, second of all, I think... Uh, this speech is two things. First of all, there's a, global, there's a global response. There's a global element to the rise in hate speech, homophobia, uh, authoritarianism, all in all. And there's, you know, the trend is clear. You know, China just closed the last LGBT-friendly center in Beijing. Uh, Russia just banned uh, certain uh, propaganda laws recently, and then they doubled down now. Erdogan is doing it. Iran is doing it. There's a global, you know, there's a, a group of nations that are undemocratic, authoritarian, trying to challenge the, the, the global uh, 
يعني I would say order uh, by going after the pillars of what democratic liber- uh, the liberal societies are. And I think the gay community and the LGBT community, it's, not, it's really not about individuals. I think you can judge a society by how it treats its marginalized community. So this is an obvious first target to attack. So there's this global element to it, and Nasrallah is, trying to, is already aligned with this camp of uh, countries we've, we've mentioned. And then there's also, secondly, there's the... Um, Uh, internal local uh, uh, context, it's uh, one week or 10 days before August uh, 4. Mm. Uh, the country is col- completely collapsed. Uh, and he wants to tell people that he's uh, now protecting them from this moral threat as if it compensates for all of the deterioration and destruction that we've had. So uh, it's a diverge, it's, it's, a, it's a, he's diverting attention. And this is why the Post specifically brought back Uh, to the to the conversation, all of the things they do. So I, uh, it was it was a political response to uh, to what he's trying to attempt to do, which is take hold of the narrative and change our attention. So yeah, I've seen you uh, attack certain individuals through Polyblog, and it seems to be a little more measured. But this one felt almost like it's personal and that you wanted it to be directed towards him? No, no, he's, I, he's calling for the death of people. I don't know how I could overreact to this. I don't, no, no, I don't I think, think it's that, impossible to overreact. No, I, uh, let me then ask again about what you said was privilege. What did you mean exactly by that? You're privileged to write what you write? I feel a certain level of protection, which is just being removed from a threatening environment. I live in a more tolerant place. But that being said, it's a very small country. Also, oh, geographically, you yes, feel? Yes, geographically. Oh, oh, geographically. I'm not, talking not Instagram. You felt... No, no, no. I, see, I feel yeah. like a, lo- a certain level of geographic protection, of course. I see. Um, well, then, in that case, let me take it to another area. Mm-hmm. Before we get into more marginalized issues, which I think those are very important. Yeah. Uh, geographically, whenever you insult the army, you're in trouble. Yeah. And you've done that. No. Well, not insult, but you've attacked. Please, all of you, open your phones. Okay, you know what? You're right. Let me say it we, differently. We neither attacked. No, sorry, sorry. You're nor right. Nor insulted. We stated a fact. You k- jumped to a conclusion. No, we left an open question. Okay, well, you know what? That's Now this feels like an interrogation. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, of course. No, I thought that it was a, it was a brave stand to condemn the army. But mm. that has real limits mm. and expression towards the army is monitored aggressively. Mm. So you're right. I'll, I'll take that back. You weren't insulting directly. You weren't attacking. You did attack Hezbollah yesterday. You did insult in a way the thought process. Of I ha- counterattacked Hezbollah. Hezbollah is attacking first. We, need, we always need to. Okay. F- fine. You're right. But the, <laughs> you, you are absolutely right. Yeah. That's not the same tone you took towards the army. Mm. But I think you crossed their red line mm. and how they monitor expression against them. Mm. I mean, maybe that's a better way of saying it. In other words, you were willing. If, re- if what I said crosses the line, I think the line needs to move a little. There's no problem with what I said. No, But I think the, pro- the line is too close. So what? I didn't see other outlets or social media uh, platforms commenting the way you commented. So we're, that's not protection. You're, you're not protected. Let's, let's contextualize this to everybody yeah. who has no idea what yeah. we're talking about. So I think it was four weeks ago, there was an accident after the uh, abduction of a Saudi citizen. And they accidentally shot at, a diff- at the wrong car uh, during an ambush. And uh, somebody uh, ended up with a bullet in his head. And he's still in the coma, I think, right? So uh, we waited four days uh, and we realized that no media outlet has brought this to attention. La uh, digital, wala TV, wala radio, wala newspaper, nothing. Total silence. So we wrote about it. But I think there's silence. In fact, some outlets did write something about it and then they deleted it. Ah, oh, come in. Even right. worse. So, Even so worse. No, but that's exactly my point, that they know that they're, they're, there's a yeah. set line. Yeah. An unfair one. Yeah. You went over it. Yeah. Why? You know that there's that they're watching, they're listening. You don't seem to worry about that. Mm-mm. Okay. I know if it carries a price, it will carry a price. But uh, I know what is activism? It's it's not pacifism. It's not uh, it's not working within the margins of what uh, they deem acceptable. Otherwise, I know we're not pushing any envelopes. We're not. Uh, what's the point? And imagine being an activist in an authoritarian state and then uh, playing by their rules and within within what they will allow you to do. Go back to architecture. 
So the first time I've heard you refer to yourself as an activist, would you consider that outlet as an activist oriented? Oh, we're all activists in this outlet. Okay. Every single one of us is an activist. I see. Because God knows we're not doing it for the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so activism. Yeah. You're also part of, you're, you belong to a member that's, I think, activist oriented. It's proud Lebanon. Yeah. And it defends all types of accusations or attacks or whatever. Anything that's deemed insulting or derogatory towards the gay community. Mm -hmm. And I think it seeks many things, one of which is decriminalization mm -hmm. uh, and, and many more things. And there's people that are from traditional social, parties. Social and political reform is how I see it. That's not how the, uh, the linguistics of the NGO are. It's a, bit, it's a bit more complexly worded, but yes. Yeah. So take me down that road a bit. We'll segue back to Polyblog. Um, what, what kind of activism are you doing there that's different than Polyblog? I think it's all the same. I think... Uh, it comes from the idea that uh, politics and politicians, they follow social uh, uh, attitudes and not the other way around. So politicians, members of parliament, they don't go against the stream of what is considered uh, socially acceptable or attainable. What they do is they work within them. The job of media, the entertainment industry in some places, uh, pop culture is to uh, widen the limits of, of uh, or, okay, so I'm going to try to explain this in a way that's at le you know, the least boring as possible, but I don't promise. Uh, there's, a, there's a concept in political science called the Overton window, and it basically uh, it, it illustrates a window on a hypothetical uh, spectrum of ideas on any single topic. Let's say in the, let's say in the, in the case of uh, mode of government, from, from being a totally centralized state to being a, to a confederation of... Uh, so this is the full spectrum. The Overton window is a hypothetical window that can uh, move along these lines, and everything within it is what society deems acceptable and attainable. And this window can shrink, and it can expand, and it can move. And politicians usually work within the confinements of what society thinks is normal, but they don't, they don't challenge the confinements. What challenges these confinements is uh, media and the entertainment industry, and uh, and uh, social uh, social activism. So there is a uh, yani there are two parallel lines to to the work that we try to do. Uh, there's the work that we have to challenge social uh, attitudes, so that society signals to politicians that we are ready for more change because the other barely ever happens. And then there's the actual uh, the work we do on the in the political stream, which is pu push for these reforms and these laws and these. Uh, uh, you know, uh, legislations when it's ready, when 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 we're ready enough. So through so communication, it's, it's more culture than politics. It then. is politics. Is, um, culture is everything. It's the root of everything. Okay. You know, uh, social uh, value, the people's values, their attitudes, uh, their norms, their habits, uh, their the trends, the moods. It's all culture. Yeah. And then politics uh, is. Uh, the uh, legalization and the codification of this culture. Right. And is there any legal agenda there behind Proud Lebanon in terms of drafting laws? I'm, I'm sure there is because we are in desperate need of laws. I mean, yeah. Lebanon is one of the 60, 60 countries in the world, I think, that still uh, puts gay people in jail. Yeah. Uh, For context, by the way, the, the group we're referring to, Proud Lebanon, includes traditional party figures that you wouldn't expect. So, for example, some, some of their supporters are Elias Henkash from Kateib, and someone who surprised me, actually, George Aes from Lebanese Forces. I did an episode with him on MTV referring to this group, Proud Lebanon. He sent me all the attacks he was getting mm. just for talking about it and defending gay rights in Lebanon. Yeah. I think they were all coming from Jnud al I can assure you there's a much wider... Uh, pool of support, but most of these uh, MPs uh, uh, play it under the radar and I understand. Yeah. And I think it's very important not to overstate the, the work that's being done because this is, will generate a lot of backlash that we're not ready for. We've already seen escalatory backlash in the last six months. Uh, and uh, we're, we're you know, Lebanon, is, uh, Lebanon is being um, scapegoated 
uh, in a global uh, cultural war because we're in the middle of the East and West and we're actually in the middle of this storm. So if I were to try to draw it out, Polyblog mm -hmm. is your opinion mm -hmm. on these issues and there's an activist lens that's written by Sara and Misha, yeah. among others. Yeah. Uh, Proud Lebanon, which you at least support. I'm a board member. You're a board member. Yes. Is cultural expression and political reform when possible? Social and political reform uh, to, uh, to attitudes toward uh, all uh, minority and marginalized communities, yes. When you see them working together naturally. There's a sort of solidarity that you cannot... Uh... Okay. And then take that one step further, and I think you do this most effectively... Uh, even though sometimes traditional party figures are on your side, mm. and it could be those two members of parliament, for example, which you do not really defend. Which, which, which with, we do not take for granted. You don't take it for granted, but you also, you're not really talking about them so much. Uh, I think of Polyblog as holding October 17 to account mm. more than anything. Yeah. And just scanning these posts feels like there's added pressure on the MPs that emerge from October 17. Yeah. Not the traditional party MPs. No. So why do you focus on the newest, most vulnerable members of parliament that are under such enormous pressure? One of them is Najat Saliba. Uh, you've written posts uh, almost addressing them. One is to Halimi Kakur. Mm -hmm. I forgot the name of the post. It's like, Dear Halimi. Dear Halimi Kakur. Dear Halimi Kakur. And she replied. Yes. Yeah. So you're actually, you're putting extra emphasis on them. Yeah. So why do you do that? Why don't you? Put because we've put extra emphasis on them when we were endorsing them for the elections. I mean, it's proportional. Of course, I, again, I, uh, I, I got a lot of responses to certain posts. Why don't you uh, address what the Tashnak are doing? Because I never believed in the Tashnak to begin with. <laughs> you know, it's. I mean, it, it should be. It should be self-explanatory. Of course, there's. Uh, uh, this entire movement is held to account. Our uh, she because in Arabic we say غلطة الشاطر بألف, and they uh, positioned themselves as the solution, and this is part of accountability. The same way we 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 endorse and the same way we actually promote and the same way we support some of these statements. Uh, uh, this is all part, I think, of uh, accountability, criticism, and uh, endorsement. But I wouldn't say it's unfair. I I would say. Uh, it's never, it's never badly intentioned, of course. Mm. It's always constructive. And it's always, uh, it's always intended to uh, remind, people of, uh, remind these people of the source of their legitimacy and the source of their power. Because 350,000 votes gained by the October 17 in total, I can assure you the momentum was mostly built through media. So... People don't, didn't know them. Most people didn't know who they were before they got elected. They voted for them because it was a sanctioned vote. And, there was, and the trend uh, was, and the, the momentum and the trend was directed through comms and media. So I feel like the source of their power comes from this, uh, you know, this brand that I think has taken a lot of hits. And uh, the, the viability of this uh, brand is what they need to preserve. So bef we'll, we'll wrap it up with the functionality of yeah. social media. Yeah. Because that's quite interesting in itself. Do you subscribe to the view that digital media is why these 13 MPs are in parliament? I, ca I can't see the direct I can't link. imagine the same results or anything near them without the support of digital activist-driven media. So maybe we can ask Najat, since you're yes. here. Do you, and let's pass the microphone actually, yes. uh, if we can give it to Najat. Before, we'll do this before the q and A. I'm curious if you found yourself when you were running for elections, not post-elections, but pre-elections, scanning digital media to see what people were writing about you and your politics. Did you feel like there was pressure from social media that you took into consideration? First, uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the question. Thank you, George, for the invitation. Uh, I want to say, uh, first, I want to uh, talk about why it's fair to criticize the change MPs. Just because our constituents are educated and they made their free choice to choose MP. 
which is extremely important. It's not an ideology that was passed from one generation to another. It's a free choice based on some criteria. And that's why it's very fair to be criticized. And I welcome this and I accept it, although I'm not really avid on social media as I should be. Mm. But I do respect the opinion of, of the voters and I value it a lot because, because it's, it's, it's an educated uh, vote. That's first. Second, for me personally, because I didn't have enough resources, the digital media is what got me elected and mm. nothing else. So I totally agree with George that this, wow. is, this played a very, very important factor. What I miss now is the digital backup mm. that I don't have right. because also of limited resources. If I had... If I have allocated resources for the digital presence now to showcase what I'm doing, I think I would be more present. But I can't do it because I don't, I cannot afford it. But it's great to hear the bold assertion that digital media brought you into parliament. I, you know, I, th I thought that it would skew the other way. Mm. I thought still Marcel or sometimes Albert maybe, but that an interview on Al Jadid would be mo far more impactful than digital media support. That's interesting to hear that. So maybe I could ask you again, First, George. let me say something. Yeah. Whenever you feel like anything that uh, uh, you are doing, you, that you deserve to be highlighted. You don't need, uh, we are an open platform, just reach out. You have my number and we will, we will highlight it. Thank you so much. So, so yeah, it's a proof of concept. Yeah, that's good to hear. Which, which is why, I think it's so, sorry. That's why yeah, you focus yeah. on them more than because you are taking credit for no, help. no, no, no. It's it's not a sense of ownership. Mm. It's a sense of we've seen you get elected. We want to see you get re-elected. We want to see. see you grow. Yeah. So we need to uh, promote you as much as we need to keep reminding you of uh, what it will take to preserve uh, your viability. I see. So it's a, it's a sense of guidance, not ownership. Right. That's really interesting to hear this. I, I don't, I mean, I, I didn't, I thought the opposite was true. No, no, I mean, I can, I can look at the insights of some of our posts. Uh, we did a small campaign a few days before the elections and we put pictures of MPs uh, that, that uh, you know, are pillars of the, uh, of the establishment. And we put pictures of uh, change MPs who are running. And we said, if this wins, if this person wins, this person loses. And we did one for Mark Dow and Talal Erslin. We said, if Mark Dow wins, Talal Erslin loses. Two days before, three days before the elections, there was 1,700 sends. There was 1,700 people that sent this post to somebody they know, they know probably votes in this con constituency. So actually, that's a nice way to wrap up the first part of the yeah. episode with exactly what you're talking about. I want to say that I've learned everything about social media thanks to George Wardini. He even... <laughs> As a friend, he would look at my Instagram account and just insult it left and right. <laughs> what is this post? It didn't get these likes. Look at the insights. You post at 1 a.m., Rooney. <laughs> it's true. For my American audience. <laughs> yes. And he showed me the insights into Instagram, which I didn't even know existed. Demographics. In terms of attention span, he taught me how to do a reel that actually works. Not a reel that I thought was appropriate. You're very good at limited attention span persuasion. Mm. I think that's a fair is way to... Is that a compliment or is it like... It's like it's, a double-handed compliment. It, it's, <laughs> it's a double-handed compliment. Yeah. <laughs> because I think it is a limited attention span mm. platform. Mm. Instagram, mm. and you said it already at the beginning, is yeah. more entertainment than anything. The, yeah, okay. The, the, People the, go on Instagram for entertainment. Yeah, it's... Instagram is not designed for news, but people no. do put news on it. We found ways to adapt formats. Right. And also, it's, it needs to be said, you don't use Twitter. 
which I think is where most people are fighting with yeah, each because, other. Because, uh, because we don't have the resources to pull a successful uh, crossover into Twitter, not because, it's, uh, not because we're uh, married to Instagram or we don't believe in Twitter. I really, you know, we, there's a lot of things that we would love to do, but we simply don't have the resources to pull You them. found a reason to be an expert on Instagram, not on TikTok, not on threads, oh, if God. that even works people, yet. People on TikTok can't even vote, Roni. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but I, I see you... It could be, and it's not an exaggeration, 16 hours of the day, you're looking at Instagram. You're, oh, God, no. You're, you're, I hope not. Most of the time I've seen Well, no, you, we need to check. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you taught me how to better use it. Yeah. And you're talking about, you're able to see and monitor how many people are sharing a political post. Yeah. So let's, I mean, these are, bas- this doesn't, you know, this doesn't require a lot of uh, uh, knowledge. I, I, I think the word expert is... Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's maybe over overstating it, but you're very smart at it. So why are you uh, producing certain types of content today mm. as opposed to others? Mm. Meaning you've limited yourself, I think, to what Instagram offers. Mm. You're not going bigger. Mm. You've left it on one page. It's effective, mm. but I don't think it's as effective as it could be. Yeah, and you're doing a lot of detail-oriented work. Mm. Meaning you're getting the content just right. Mm. So why do you focus on certain issues and not others? Why isn't Polyblog like Megaphone, like Dadaj Media? Why is it still in its smaller state? I think I don't think you should compare Polyblog who, that is two years old to Megaphone that is nine. You, sh- you can compare two-year-old Polyblog to two-year-old Megaphone, and then we can see. Mm. I think they would still have been and you know, had been doing a. Uh, Better job simply because the, the the size of their team has grown exponentially, and uh, but but I you know, I I think uh, we're I think we're on a when we're on a very good uh, course mm. we're on a very good uh, uh, parkour I would say but I you know, I would I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it uh, I wouldn't call it yet I wouldn't say that things have reached their uh, peak but um, what, what I would like it, what, to do what is it missing yeah what I would like to do. Uh, and I think it's very effective. And, and uh, what Dr. Najat said uh, encourages me to think of that even more. I think what uh, this political scene requires, the reform-oriented political scene, it requires a, a proper media infrastructure that can really amplify their voices. And it's, it would be a force multiplier. And I think if we can set up this infrastructure, uh, be it through long format, show format, Instagram, Twitter, uh, a digital newspaper, everything, everything at our disposal, if we can use an in a, in a, in a umbrella of 20, 30 uh, um, platforms and uh, different things, I think we would amplify our voices so much more. And I think we could, uh, we could really match, uh, you know, we could close the gap of uh, underprivilege that we have in terms of uh, visibility and uh, audibility. So it's simply a matter of funding. That's oh, the, absolutely. I see. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, most of the platforms you uh, you have uh, mentioned, they have uh, public sources of funding and it's uh, amounts that they deserve, but there are, there are 30, 40 times what we can actually try to like, you know? So it is a matter of funding, yes. So to wrap up the episode, mm-hmm. before we get to the break and q and I'm trying to imagine a donor and you. Mm working together yeah and the reason i say it's such a bomb- bombastic way is because <laughs> i know that you are and everything you do you tend to be a one-man show one person show so let me let me say it differently you like to have your way in most of what you do mm. i can imagine a donor or a sponsor not being completely at ease with the flexibility you have right now mm. so how would that look like if it comes to yeah, no, there, there's going to have to be a compromise. Uh, but I think uh, it's very important to find donors that are o- already very aligned with your mission and values. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, no, there will be a lot of unnecessary friction. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I've never dealt with this issue before. 
you're right there are certain values that i would be uncompromising on if a donor قال لي مثلا خفف على نصر الله ولا خفف على شو عرفني i would be like انه no. well i can i can posit a question for you yeah polyblog yeah which is largely your views yeah takes a different tone when it comes to the syrian refugee crisis oh yeah so let, let me yeah. let me lay this out most digital media or independent media mm. alternative media whatever activist media yeah they're extremely sympathetic yeah to the plight of syrian refugees yeah who's who's talking sorry guys we're almost done almost done anna tablo man qaid lkon asamikon we're almost done uh daraj and megaphone mm. tend to be i don't want to make this personal jean asir with yana mal oh even worse <laughs> <laughs> no, they tend to toe the line when yeah. it comes to the typical leftist position, yeah. which you can transcend across the world. Yeah. And I think your heart is there. It's not like your heart is not there. But when you post about the Syrian refugee dilemma, crisis, etc., you don't subscribe to what they write. Mm-mm. So that kind of position would be, I think, out of sync with the donor that helps yeah. those outfits. True. So what would that look like for Polyblog? First let's talk about let me go back to the first thing you know one of the first things we said in the episode it's how we we don't uh, label ourselves as a, exclusively a rightist or a leftist and this mm. is a great example mm. of how we can have a different approach uh, than the typical leftist approach on the refugee crisis but we can have an almost identical approach to the typical leftist approach on LGBT rights because we are taking what we believe is uh, makes sense in the moment Uh, the statistics of refugees in Lebanon would be totally rejected in any of the most huma- humanitarian countries and societies in the world. It's not like uh, what we're saying is uh, is يعني, anti-humanist or like even even the uh, the governments that uh, fund some of the most active uh, organizations that support human rights in the world, they would never allow this level of, you know, they would never allow 50% of their population to be I think we've we've talked about this in one of the posts we made, uh, at some point the European Union had um, uh, 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 allowed its member states to pick quotas for refugees yeah. and the biggest number was 5% Right In Lebanon it's almost 50% that's the equivalent of 200 million refugees in Europe So uh, the position seems very easy to take. It's not like we had to really think about it. Of course, here we have to draw the line between two very uh, you know, extreme opinions. Scapegoating refugees for the collapse of the country is the, you know, it only serves the, people, the actual criminals in this situation, uh, first of all. Uh, second of all, uh, promoting hate speech, I will just outright say it would be disgusting. So we're not doing either or. We're just saying that there's a huge elephant that we can no longer uh, ignore under the guise of don't be racist, don't be xenophobic. No. Uh, uh, the, the anxieties and the fears of the, of the people who are worried about demographic change are valid. We're not going to invalidate that. And invalidating people's anger actually turns anger into violence. So if you were really angry and I'm ignoring your anger, eventually you're going to come up and hit me. So I think acknowledging the issue, or well, you're going to try. <laughs> I think acknowledging the issue, first of all, serves to diffuse uh, the problem around it. I think it's also very important for uh, average citizens not to feel like they have to choose uh, between uh, being worried and being humane. Because most people would choose to be worried. So I think it's very important to, to show people, يعني, show the average citizens a prototype, and no, you can be humanitarian and uh, يعني, uh, you can be liberal and progressive uh, where you need to be, and you, you have the right to be concerned uh, where you don't need to be. It's not an either or situation. مش يعني, you subscribe to the full umbrella of causes of the left or you don't subscribe. Hey, del, no. Hmm. Uh, يعني, if, you, if you have to be if you have to be a progressive today you have to be you have to adopt the entire umbrella of causes as they are oh you're not a progressive so and say, i think this pushes people away from the cause I, i think the word which has been said on this podcast several times i think the word is nuance yeah and sitting in your chair a few months ago was albert costanian 
and he talked about nuance on his show mm -hmm. and that it delivers better. On a smaller scale, you're, you don't have a show on LBC, obviously. But I think you're trying to bring the better actors of October 17 to light. You're also trying to filter, I think, the racism towards mm. refugees or the extreme prejudice, mm. but also holding maybe European law to account. Mm. I think the, a recent post highlighted that. Yep. It was going after some paragraph in the European Union. It, it was uh, the 13th. So the European Parliament passed uh, 16 excellent positions on Lebanon and, and then, one highly problematic right. one. And we made sure to yani, show both sides of the story. Right. Uh, so you're not you're not chasing anxiety or fears or xenophobia. No, for, for we're not fear mongering. You're yeah, not fear mongering. And clearly, even though you do you do take a look at insights, you're very you're very uh, aware of those insights. You're not doing it for clickbait. Mm. And I think that's actually quite important that you can sometimes have a smaller audience, but actually delivering the right nuance. And I want to expand from that. You're not only doing nuance every day on Polyblog. You're bringing out the best in certain characters who I think should have their stories shared. One of them is Hiba Dendeshli. You produce oh. her show, What Works for Hiba. <laughs> You're behind the scenes to that too. You gave Zaven, I don't know where Zaven is, if he left already. He left? Oh. Zaven delivered a great show. Yes. But I think you found a way to bring him to digital media in a smooth transition, which I think helped. And now he's on that journey. Uh, you brought Polytalks to video and you helped produce a season of Polytalks. Wasn't easy, but worth it. <laughs> when <Yeah>. Naila, <laughs> I said wasn't easy, but worth it. Yeah. We, had, we really had to convince Naila to get in front of a camera. Well, you did it <laughs> and she looks great. Yes. Right? You also bring out a lot of youth talent, whether it's Sara Al Asmar, who's helping me on, on my podcast, or Misha, who's writing for Polyblog and was part of Albert's show, yeah. which is a great background right. to work for you. With. <laughs> you, sh you should be working for her. Probably. <laughs> and also She's an actual journalist. She's a real journalist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, like I'm, I'm, I'm a one of you. <laughs> and thanks to you, your nuance also credits and celebrates the hard work of somebody like Najat Saliba. Yes. So I think you're on the right path. Thank you. We'll take a small break and then we'll make the Q&A fun. Perfect. Thank you, George Verdine. Thank you, Ronia. Patrick, you are still here? Did he leave already? Where he's, is he's, he? he's in hiding. That guy <laughs> in the back, that gentleman, I should say, is the Patrick Risha I was referring to at the beginning. Yeah. You should host him on your show. <laughs> let, let me quote. This is what an ambush looks like. <laughs> no, no. Let, let me quote an uh, Instagram user that stalks me online. Enough kate'ib. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've scaled down. Is this someone we know? Yeah. Oh, we're yeah. We're enough kate'ib. <laughs> Next season with Patrick Risha. <laughs> so that's Patrick Risha. That's the reason I know George Bardini. Let me quickly, off the top of my head, uh, anyone that wants to follow what George Bardini has done, there's outfits I have not mentioned. One of them mm -hmm. is called Wassel Sautak which was pre-elections. That's George Wardini behind the scenes. No, we were five people. Five people, but you're about five people, so that doesn't oh. matter. <laughs> well, I can lose weight, but you can't gain height, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> this is my last episode on the Beirut Vanya. <laughs> That was good. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to pause. <laughs> and I'm going to let you tell the audience what happened on my scooter. Oh. 
I, I do not assume responsibility. Eh? I'm an really? observer in the story. <laughs> so, you know what I like about this part, doing it in Alias, is that I film only us, but I get to see everything that moves in the background. And every episode, there's oddballs that show up and just sort of look inside, right? <laughs> Tonight, my little electric scooter is parked outside. The reason it's dented is George Verdini. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll quickly, before we get back into what can, you Can do. I tell the story? Okay, fine. Because I will tell the real story. Tell the real story. Okay. <laughs> so we were having, I think, lunch at Abyssin. And then I had to be somewhere and you offered this, this me This is why ride. I'm single, by the way. I'm having lunch at Abyssin <laughs> with George Wardini. Keep it fine. No, I'm... But... So we're having lunch at Abyssin and uh, he offers to give me a ride somewhere. And uh, it was the day where all the taxi drivers were on strike. So all of Ashrafi The was, highway was blocked, all the roads were... All of Ashrafi was hidden. And we're going down the... What's the what's, name? What's, Nazlet Nazlet Akkewe. Akkewe, right. Yeah. And I think it was still kind of wet that day. There had been a little bit it of rain. It was dry. It was dry. Then, it, okay, I remember now what happened. There was these uh, regar in the middle of the road. Ziyad <laughs> Dabi he, he, he should have... Done, he should no, have no, I think he put that there. Had al Hadid. al Hadid. Yeah. No, he put other material. Recycled Hadidi. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, في الحديدة بالأرض وفي فوق كيس نايلون. There's a plastic bag. She kiss nylon got stuck. Into no, no. What? Hold on, hold on, hold on. So the last thing I remember is asking Groni, do you regret offering me a ride because there's so much traffic? And he goes, no. <laughs> and then he slips. And Roni is yeah, wait, 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 stuck wait, 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 between. Wait, wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on, no, 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 no. <laughs> Just for context, this is downhill. My scooter goes like that. Okay, I fly off the scooter, but guess who's right behind me? Is George Verdini. So we're both oh. in midair. Okay, the scooter goes in one direction, and I crash on the pavement, and I'm looking up. And this is actually 100% true. I'm looking 30%. up. 30%. And I see George Verdini about to fall on me. <laughs> and he crashes on me. So I am a pancake on Nezlet Akkewe. And I'm literally, you know the birds that circle above your head? I was looking at the sky. This is 100% true. George can attest to this. I cannot, because it's not true. <laughs> no. George is on me. His leg is still on me. And that's enough, you know? And <laughs> And I can barely breathe. I can barely I'm move. I'm sorry. It's your problem if you're that fragile. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And I, I, I'm like, where am I? And suddenly a stranger's face is right above me. Yeah. And it's like, he's like, Roni, fini echot selfie? This is true. <laughs> and I'm like, who are you? I'm like, I'm like, maybe I died and reached Ashrafi heaven, you know? I'm like, who are you? He's like, back, back to Trablos heaven. <laughs> And I look at him, who are you? He's like, I'm a the podcast. And he literally <laughs> selfies himself. I'm on the floor and I'm waving. <laughs> <laughs> so that's weight right there. Yeah. Yeah. He actually, he wanted, he gave me a book that he wrote. Yeah. He signed. And, and then when you went back home, your foot was injured. Yeah. So Roni was like this, his foot up, and he was reading the book that he just got. <laughs> yeah. It was very ironic. So, Wasil <laughs> Sauta. <laughs> He's also produced The Happy Hour. If you know The Happy Hour show with Ramzi Abu Ismail, that's George Wardini. Uh, Shout out to Ramzi, I wish he was here. Asseha, which we mentioned earlier, and that's two seasons in. Uh, one season of Polytox with Nail Al Khouri. Two seasons, uh, sorry. Two, I think, right? Two, two seasons. Two months of Saturday is thanks to him. What works for Hiba? Sitting, sitting at the bar. I mean, you're all over the place. You've collaborated with me. I don't know what's next. He's going to be on Marcel Ghanem Salwa. It's oh, smacking no. people left and right, <laughs> getting punched. That's just a way to credit all the behind the scenes work you do day in, day out. Thank you. In addition to Polyblock. Thank you. So let's make the Q&A fun. Most people here are friends and family. Let's be extra hard on George Verdini tonight. Take, and take it away. full advantage. <laughs> First question to the gentleman at the bar. Just say your name and what you do and who your father is. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Hi, my name is Emil. Uh, I'm a law student. I'm also a member of the National Blog General Assembly. Uh, and I follow Polyblog uh, 
very You've every day. You've written for Polyblog. I've written not? once for Polyblog. I have a question regarding Polyblog. Uh, so you claim to be an independent uh, social media platform. Being, uh, being affiliated to local, uh, uh, to local players that are from the context is so much, uh, to me, is much more independent than being uh, funded by uh, foreign governments, which is the case for a lot of uh, quote-unquote independent media outlets. Uh, I'm not on anybody's payroll and uh, I am totally free to write whatever I want, and I, especially when I'm talking about actual governments. So this is how I manage. I never had to manage. It was never an issue. I hope this answers you. Thanks. You're welcome to be harder on George Wilson. <laughs> Any harder on, I'll leave. <laughs> no, you stay uh, hi there. Thanks for this podcast. Um, my name's Cormac. I'm from the US. I'm an English teacher in France. I wanted to ask about the rise of fake social media posts and bots. And I mean, there are stories, you know, like the owners of the French soccer team, like hired a Spanish firm to insult Kylian Mbappe. But then there's also, you know, more nefarious with Cambridge Analytica, which is actively manipulating people's perception of, say, American politics to swing an election. How, since I'm a visitor here and I don't really know anything about what's going on, how prevalent is this in Lebanon and how do you see ways of combating it? I'm sure there is some sort of uh, intelligence meddling in, uh, in uh, media, but Lebanese politics is not uh, significant enough to attract the, this level of uh, attention that you're talking about. Uh, I've never come across anything that I felt was, uh, you know, was that highly manufactured. But sadly, uh, as I said earlier in the episode, we did most of our damage to ourselves. We shot ourselves in the foot. We did not need any help doing that, sadly. So, uh, so yeah, there's not that scale that you've described, but of course there's meddling. No, but let me build on that question, which is a great sure. question. And I've asked it to many people that live in this space. I asked it directly. Lara Bitar, Jean Asir, Diana Mellid. I asked it even to Jair Ghassan, mm. who is a podcast. Uh, and we actually did a Seha episode about mm. alternative media. And I think that's the biggest problem. And he's, he's right. How do you fact check? I know that you're doing less standard reporting and more opinion, mm. but you do cite, you do refer to mm. what seem to be fact-based mm. evidence. What is your fact checking? I think the nature of our content is not uh, as reactive as a news outlet. We don't have to report on something the moment it happens. Sometimes we take a day or two just because we want to develop an opinion. And uh, that extra buffer time space is what, يعني, if we're writing something and it would usually take one or two days to surface as if something is fake. So I think this plays to our advantage in uh, naturally filtering uh, fake news. I think there has been an incident before that we've posted something that was inaccurate and then we had to take it down and uh, issue another post. Uh, I remember the situation was uh, when there was a, um, uh, a boat stuck in sea and uh, it was uh, allegedly carrying ammonium nitrate and it was trying to enter Be uh, mm. Beirut port. Yeah. And of course, we were very reactionary at this moment. We did not, uh, we did not wait uh, to do any uh, fact-checking because it's such a provocative piece of information. And it was cited by MTV and other reputable, and Nahar, I think. And then it, it turned out to be fake. So we took it down and we posted a, a, a story. But other than that, we've never, had, we've never dealt with fake news because we don't, we don't, we're not uh, rushing to uh, report on anything on the spot. So the extra time we have helps us uh, filter. Filtering, I see. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Uh, Najat Saliba. Hi. <coughs> Maybe I want to stand up. I don't know if you can hear me well. Yes? It's, it's a bit uh, philosophical, but yet very practical. So when I was at AUB, I thought I'm a scholar activist. So we, you know, took our time to think about what scholar activism is. And then when I entered into politics... And you just said also in the interview that you're an activist, right? Yeah. So, so there is this definition or reflection on what activism is and whether or how much social media can play in the activism and whether the expectations of the responses that you get on social media 
are leading to some impact on the ground. And I want to link this to our absence in the activism realm in physic physically, mm. but we're very much active and present on social media. And in your opinion, how much this has impacted mm. the revolution negatively or positively? And why not now also taking this activism towards making some change? Mm. You know, it's all interrelated, but... Uh, there is so many things that I'm trying to also make sense out of. So let me check if I understood the question correctly. You're asking me, is uh, people uh, switched from physical on the ground, grassroots activism, going to digital activism, is th if this is a positive or a negative thing? And, uh, uh, How much is digital presence mm. has an impact on change? Mm. Um, Uh, I would say activism would be you know, is, a, is a multifaceted uh, thing and people choose the realms uh, that they are comfortable with. Some people are activists in uh, you know, Naabit or in schools or in universities. Um, and, uh, to me, I felt uh, attracted to, to media because uh, it's about talking to people rather than trying to lobby or do like the inside politics of small organizations. Um, and it was the thing that was you know, at my access. But I think all of these different facets, there needs to be some level of uh, coordination where their work becomes complementary to one another rather than uh, so to speak. So, uh, no, in the Thawra days, uh, the, the excess of chaos and lack of coordination in social media was a very negative thing. That's what, that's what I mean when I see, say we shot ourselves in the foot. Uh, we were sending out conflicting messages. We were confusing people. Uh, we were uh, attacking one another at some point towards the end. So the average viewer would, would feel like, why even bother in this hot mess? Uh, so no, I think it played a very negative role. But it also had its, uh, you know, it, it also played a role in uh, uh, getting people to the streets, getting people to vote. I say the missing element was leadership. Had there been a some sort of a leadership that directs uh, the discourse, the communication, all activists everywhere in whatever realms they had, that's what we lacked. We lacked leadership, uh, and in the absence of leadership, uh, uh, we lost our way. Now we have you guys which means uh, we, ha we have uh, a political organizations, uh, even though maybe uh, two, three, too many, maybe they should be merged at some point. And we have, uh, we have you guys in parliament, we have something to build on and we have something to, to protect because we had nothing in the, we had, now we have something to lose. Now we have to make sure in the next elections we can get more people like you into parliament. So hopefully you could play a role in trickling down this uh, infrastructure building and create an actual leadership because that's what we really need. Could I actually ask you, Najat, maybe give the mic to Najat. The, I, I don't know if it's directly related to this, but I think it's at least sort of, it's on a parallel road. Um, I think of you as an activist too, even though you're a member of parliament. And I think you can be both. And I think that's an extremely difficult task because you need the support of digital media platforms always and I've even noticed on Twitter sometimes you tweet like an activist would tweet and I think that's it sends two messages that one you're still in that space but also you're in parliament and you're trying to do both because maybe there isn't enough support from the digital media space I'll give one example because I just thought of this um, I think it was a tweet directed at Nasser Yassin and Jamal Aitene about trash on the, not trash, uh, wasted food that's thrown on the side. And that felt like it's an activist uh, trying to get a minister and a mayor's attention and also a member of parliament trying to do the same thing. So I can imagine the burden is harder because you don't have that initial support you had pre-elections. It's almost like you're filling the void too. Yes, it's a, 
It's a, it's a schizophrenic a bit, you know. You want to revolt, but at the same time, you want to fulfill your job as an MP. Mm. And you want to attack the government, but at the same time, you need to find solutions and you want to also be able to, to come up with laws that protect people's interests. And because we don't have a president, we can't have a general assembly to fulfill. You know, it's all this mess. And then you are in this mess and you, you yeah. don't know what to do. It's not like you don't know what to do, but you are battling against a government that is inefficient, in, incapable of doing yeah. its job. But at the same time, you're frustrated of what, you know, because the situation is not being fixed. And even maybe... But my, yeah. my question was more into directed into social media. We see a lot of activisms on social media. But how much impact does this, you know, go mm. towards change right now as we have the MPs inside? That's my question. Oh. And I want to back up my question with a research that I did. And, and the research says that the impact of the response that you get on social media on actually seeing a change happen on the ground is very disproportionate. Mm. And it didn't only happen in Lebanon. It's something that happens globally, that you see lots of responses on social media, yet, yet the impact on the ground is very little. Mm. So this is where I wanted your feedback on or your yeah, you know your your comment on. Could I interject sure. and then you uh, sure, sure. you end it? Uh, I I'll try to match it to a recent example of where there was a huge void in support. So, uh, whatever your thoughts are on the presidential process and the candidates that come and go, uh, I said this on this podcast. I've said it to you directly. I've said it to people that didn't vote this way. So I'm comfortable acknowledging this fully. Uh, the moment that the last round happened, I think you deserved more support for voting for Jihad Azour. I think you didn't get enough support from this space. That's where activism, I think, should kick in more. You did on Polyblog regularly. You acknowledged that that was what you thought was the right decision. I actually did podcasts and called these members of parliament too. Sometimes they answer, sometimes they don't. But I think the the space was not filled. There was a, a silence. And then what happened, and I think this is what the answer is, what happens is it's an endless fight with the ideological side mm. of Puritans that overwhelm social media. And they're largely not politicians. They're just social media characters. Those, I think, are amplifying the support for the renegade October 17 MPs. Mm. And sorry to use this language, but this is how I see it. That voted for Ziad, uh, Ziad Barut. Mm. That that's the support on social media went in that direction from the Puritans, from the... I think they can be called extremists, but maybe they wouldn't use that word. Whatever the word is, yep. the rigid yep. side, uh, they had a, a lot of support. Your side didn't. And I, th I think that's how it ends. It's social media slapping left and right. But, but the three were going to vote that way with or without that support. I think that's a conclusion, too. I think the first thing we can do to be more effective is to... I, sorry, sorry I, one thing. I think yeah. they wanted to justify not voting for Jihad Azor, and they got that justification yeah. from social media. So, yeah. Yeah. But, but just to add to this... Uh, just so it picks it up in the, uh, in the episode. Can we uh, just give Najat the mic? Yes. Yeah. Just to add to this, we were nine of us. And can you imagine if there were, if we were not voting for Jihad Azour, that means he would have gotten 50 votes. Yep. So that's very, very important. And no one highlighted this fact. Mm. Yep. And everybody was focusing on the negative side. Yep. You know, it was, there was nine of us. Mm. And it took a lot of effort to combine nine people mm. to do this. Yeah. But maybe you can comment on 
the the disconnect between activism and, and reality. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, we need to differentiate between uh, activists, uh, targeted, uh, organized activists, and self-proclaimed activists. And not everybody with an Instagram account and an opinion and a few thousand followers and the time uh, is, is an activist. So I think once you filter out uh, the serious from the non-serious, then it should be, then we should measure and we should, you know, we should measure after the, the, the net product is, uh, is extracted, not the raw uh, uh, full scene. We should also uh, uh, we should also in Lebanon we should work on leveling the playing field a little bit because Roni said something the the hyper idealistic uh, renegade I, I like this word they're much more uh, um, established because this is maybe the only battle they can fight you know aside from grassroots uh, to jamaat maybe the only battle where they can actually fight is social media because social media everybody starts off with the same. Uh, same resources and they've been doing it uh, sooner so maybe uh, you know, the point is not to cancel out the other voice it's just to at least level the playing field between what I will say our and their even though I don't like it to be an us and them conversation so at least we should have a higher voice rather than worry about how to silence the other voice um But yes, I think uh, it, go, it all goes back to what I keep saying. I, I, we need to build uh, a media infrastructure and coordinate with leaderships. Hiba dan Dashley. Yeah, hi, Hiba. Allah is to. Hi, everyone. I'm Hiba. So I wanted to ask George because it's a topic that we had talked about before and you didn't, you didn't convince me with your answer back in the conversation. So I thought, hella, in front of people, you might... Uh, you thought this was a good idea? <laughs> yeah, I think this is a great idea. <laughs> okay, okay. I think your salary uh, listen, is going to change soon. <laughs> <laughs> we, we always talk about freedom of speech mm. and um, everyone having the right to say anything about anyone. Yes. Because it's a free world. And then you have that, the, the people you, uh, you talked about that have this sense of entitlement that they can actually... Uh, Uh, I don't know, push someone around on social media just because they have uh, mm -hmm. an opinion. And there's a lot of that on social media. And so where would you draw the line, mm. you as a media platform, mm. or you as a human, between freedom of speech and bullying? Okay, that's a great question. Can I add to that? You can add to that. I, I didn't feel so comfortable. We spoke about this in private. When Polly Blog shared the phone numbers of MPs mm. that were not voting for mm. Jihad Azor, mm. I thought that was too intrusive and could put. I, I didn't say that straightforward. I was just asking. This oh, is was why that? I was. Yeah, this oh, is really? part of uh, this is part of me triggering him to because that was part of a conversation. And it came after that post. Yeah. Because yeah. It so, felt like there was a mm. a different line that you usually don't cross mm. that you maybe went too far over. Mm. Uh, I don't know how convincing I will be this time because my answer didn't... You know, okay, in this country, we get to elect a president on average once every 10 years. You know, he serves six years and we stay four years in void. So whatever it takes to get it right once every 10 years, I'm willing to do it. <laughs> okay. Hey. <laughs> whatever it takes, once because it's a one in a 10 year window <laughs> of opportunity, I will go all in. <laughs> <laughs> Please. But the story of the Quran, and I think, and a lot of people contradicted the fact and we posted the numbers. But we sometimes forget, and for example, in the U.S., the house reps, their numbers are, in, you know, are public to everyone. So, in yep. the politics, you have the right to call your house rep. <laughs> So uh, Anna, I didn't think it was wrong for us. No, to no, I'm not talking about it as being wrong. Anna, I talked about it as Where being part the of the freedom of speech, mm. like freedom of expression and communication. I think of it this line. It can be on that side. It can be on this side. Where would you draw the line? I don't think of it as a straight line. <laughs> and I don't think of it as static. I think we're constantly drawing this line uh, depending on the on the context and the justification of it 
sometimes uh, desperate situations يعني, uh, require desperate uh, uh, desperate action and uh, in a moment and by the way uh, jihad azour was only six votes away from reaching the 65 mark which would have totally been a game changer so i think given that context it was totally justified to push as hard as we can and i can tell you there are a lot of people we never thought we never we didn't think they would actually go in the direction of as our we thought they would sit it and it go in the third direction from the 30 from the 13 mps and i don't think this one post alone or any one post alone pressured them enough but as a collective the pressure worked because there are names we never thought would actually do it and uh, so, sorry do you think brahim namely changed his mind because of these kinds of posts i think uh, uh, he uh, he sp- well he spoke about it on mtv so i think, I think it obviously re- left a mark he referred to it in the other way though he said that was i think he said bullying or something to that effect i think halim he, al-Kakur he, he, came in. halim and brahim complained about the post yeah. Uh, but the fact that they knew about it, I think, means that the post uh, uh, achieved its intention. Yani, uh, again, there is there is no absolute right or wrong uh, uh, answer here. But to me, the window of opportunity was so rare. We only get to do this once every 10 years, and there's an existential threat. And uh, I'm sorry, but uh, Aslan bullying is a very generous word. You know, posting somebody's number. You know, Halima, Halima, I, let me say, but Halima said, people called me and terrorized me. I'm not sure Polyblock's followers are, uh, are the ones who terrorize in this country. Uh, so maybe uh, the people who want to terrorize her can get her phone number without, any, uh, without our help. I'm actually not only talking about what you would I, I know what you're talking about. Can yeah. I say it? You can you can say anything. And I'm, um, you know, part of it, Kamena, feel entitlement mm. because you're a social media expert. You're a communications expert in Not general. An expert, okay. You are. You are at least to me. To uh, me too. And Thank yeah. So so had a sense of entitlement that some people have. Not. ضروري a media outlet that they can actually harass others, create stories, and be heard by other people. Like I think the judge here is public opinion. Uh, if these conversations are being held uh, online and in, in, in everybody's in front of everybody's uh, eyes, uh, public opinion is, should be the final judge on uh, drawing uh, the line or towing the line. Yeah, uh, uh, counter pressure or criticism to this kind of bullying, let's say, uh, should signal to the bully that you are crossing a limit. So I think you know, it constantly regulates itself. We have another question in the middle. The if I, if I may just a oh, oh, sure. little interjection here, yes, but we are a country of bullies and we're a country that support bullies. Mm. No, to some extent, yes. Hi. So, sorry, just before the question, may I sure. throw an idea? Why, there, why did you put their private numbers, not, for example, the party number or their accounts why did you go with their mobile number they they have never taken the effort to provide uh, public numbers to begin with i'm assuming because there's no brahim name number office, yeah, office. There, there's no uh, brahim Lena. Kanan, uh, of mafia they, 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 no if i'm wrong uh, no i was just know? wondering I was, i was wondering why if she doesn't know i'm sure that it's not there <laughs> yeah okay Say, uh please yes hi So my name is Renoir, I'm a psychotherapist, and uh, can you see me? Shall I stand up? Oh yeah, please. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. So, you spoke about marginalized communities, mm-hmm. and you specifically mentioned LGBT, even though I think this applies also on feminism and all of the yeah. above. And for the longest period, and you already know that I also work with these groups, and I defend, and this is causes that I've been fighting for for the past 10 years at least. However, for the longest period, we've been working from the outside, um, defending uh, these communities against all the repression, all the aggression. But I think we reached a point where it started to be um, the other way around. So among the community, we are starting to be misled. Um, there is a lack of, if I may call it psychoeducation, there is a lack of understanding of what this cause is really about. And I really think that the communities themselves are starting to shoot themselves in the foot. Mm. So. 
how um, how likely would you target it the other way around? So to tackle the communities and how harmful they are being to mm. themselves instead of targeting the outside world. Okay. So you spoke of something that's very important. You said instead of shutting uh, other voices, it's about making your own voice louder. And mm. I think that this is the same thing because at one point, we those communities felt offended, so they had to defend themselves. Mm. But for the past period, they have become offensive and mm. imposing in manners that really aren't important and they are being deflected mm. from the real cause. And even the supporters are being really ambivalent about it now because they don't really know what to support because mm. there are so many inside communities in one community. So would you take the step to target the communities instead of the outside world hackling the okay. communities? This is, uh, this is kind of an abstract question. Let me see if I understand it correctly. You are actually you're talking, I think, about a, the global, uh, the global discourse. Yani, I'm talking about what is called the, the woke or the hyper. I'm talking uh, about specific LGBT movement. I'm speaking of feminism. Okay. I'm okay. speaking of Great. where it all properly started and then super, deflected. I am super comfortable with self criticism here, and I think hey, there needs to be. You know, we, we need to hit the brakes, right? Uh, I think in the past five years. The, some of these activists have given the other side all of the ammunition they need to fire at them. But I don't think Hone uh, Darude to localize yani, to localize the LGBT struggle in Lebanon from the global landscape because it's a totally different. I think this comes from the fact that uh, as the US is the greatest cultural influence in the world, the US is a two-party system and those parties are constantly vying for more support and attention and they have resorted to identity politics and cultural wars. And we in Lebanon are paying the price for that and they are paying the price for that because the, the other side is rolling back a progress that is uh, decades old. Yani we've seen the pushback ala Roe v. Wade against abortion. We're seeing a rise in authoritarian uh, uh, right-wing, and I, I don't use the word right-wing or left-wing as negatively with negative connotation, but extreme right-wing and extreme left-wing. So we're constantly being torn between two extremes, and I totally understand how sane people have a hard time picking a team, because I don't want to choose either. So uh, yeah, there needs to be self-criticism here. And we you need see, to... It's about, I'm sorry, but it's mm. about awareness instead of self-criticism because mm. we are... You see, it's the same thing but that can, happened... Can you give me a specific Soda. example? Yes. Uh, if I were to speak specifically of, of LGBT, let's say, mm. there's, a, there's a lack of understanding of each letter and what mm. it stands for, even inside the community. Mm. Mm. So whenever you, do, you try to defend... Mm. they don't even know what to defend. And I think that mm. this is our fault, not theirs, because yes. awareness is not properly spread. We are too busy fighting instead of really building the core. Mm. So I think if we redirect things into really building a cause properly, this will, uh, again, make the voice louder. Mm. So we are too much in the offense and, and, and the aggressive defense instead of the proper structure, especially yes. recently. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this applies to the local uh, context in Lebanon. Honestly, it does. And I'm speaking out of observation. You know, okay. I've been working and I've seen how this scene has changed. Mm. And all I'm saying is this is our role to make it con continuously better. Mm. So to make it simple, mm. would you in your podcast, instead of targeting the non-supporters, mm. maybe target the community itself into mm. making it stronger, more um, cultivated, more... Um, I, I'm not sure. It's, I, don't, I don't think it's about making the community stronger. First of all, I have a big issue with the word community itself. Me too, by the way, it's but I'm using something yeah. that's, that's common. Because we're putting people in a basket because of one aspect of their identity. Exactly, and my that's point. the first problem. Especially with issue. feminism as well, okay? So it's not just about one specific yeah. community. Uh, second of all, I think it's important to include everybody in the conversation. Uh, because uh, I, I heard somebody tell me once, like, society is like a pool. Uh, if you pee in it, I have a problem. <laughs> because we're all swimming in it. So uh, everybody's cause is everybody's concern. Uh, I'm not sure how to, like, narrow down the question more, because this, this alone could be an hour. All right. So let's narrow it. Okay. Would you redirect your posts towards those who are making community mm -hmm. look bad. Not when they're being threatened by death. Not, I will not pick this battle now. 
All right, so it's about timing. Yes. Fair enough. Thanks. But I think your posts do, in a way, fulfill that demand. I mean, the post yesterday was clearly supporting that community that's being attacked. So I, I, th I think the question uh, and the conversation is a bit ambiguous. We might be putting our finger on different things. Oh, okay. I, I, I think so, right? right I, yeah. I'm not peeing in this pool today. No, no. <laughs> Thanks for the words of wisdom. <laughs> if I may interject on that one. But I, I, I do see this a lot uh, in this country specifically, but I've also seen it elsewhere, where members of the community within quotations are at odds with each other for various reasons. For example, as a bi person, I'm, at least in the, in the past, I'd, I'd be considered as weird because, mm. you know, it, you have to be either gay or hetero. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, there's a lot of that happening within the community, especially not just the LGBTQ, but also yeah. within feminism, because I know some women, friends of mine, who seem absolutely feminists, but are against the idea of feminism. Mm. Yeah, I know, I know people like this. I know people who claim to be anti-feminist, but they embody all of the uh, privileges of... of uh, mm. They benefit from the privileges of feminism, but they are anti-feminist. I think those are like very, uh, we're zooming in too much uh, on like internal struggles. And uh, as I said before, as I said about the line regulating itself, I think society also regulates itself. And when, when things go out of line, we talk about them and then we suppress them a little bit until they're like at an acceptable. Uh, but it's very, it's very normal for all of this uh, chaos to ensue because we've spent uh, you know, hundreds of years uh, all minorities have been completely silenced. So now that people have voices, yes, they might not be saying the best thing all the time, but at least they're getting to use it. And I'd much rather live in that world than the one before. Julia. Are you going to ask in Italian or English? <laughs> <laughs> if you want, I can ask in Italian. So yeah, Julia from Italy, you understood. Um, I've been working here in Lebanon for the last 10 months now. And I consider George as a, as a friend, so I will ask more of a personal question than, sure. a, than a social or political question. So um, because I see in your, that you're not a person who settles down, who like, always likes to um, push himself further and to improve himself, so I want to ask you, where do you see yourself in the next years? Uh, maybe hosting your, whole pod, your own podcast or mm. writing or still doing social media? What do you, what Host, would you host, like to do? Hosting a podcast is very tempting. I think I would want to do that at some point, but I want to pick my timing. Uh, what I'm really dedicated for, and I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record not here, is to uh, build up a, uh, a, a alternative media infrastructure from scratch and put it to good use. So that's the last time I'm going to say this today, I promise. No, but better answer that question. What do you mean? She asked, what, I, what do I see myself doing in a year? Yeah, imagine Polyblog in a year. What does it look like? Uh, with funding or without? <laughs> <laughs> Let's actually, you know what? Funding. You get $80,000 mm. fresh in a, an envelope from the German... NGO Stiftung, whatever. Mm. <laughs> whatever. I see myself sipping uh, pina coladas in Brazil where they have no extraction laws. <laughs> no, no, no really. I'm kidding. I'm well, kidding. Seriously. Let's say you get funding. What do you uh, do? I think I would look for a smarter ways uh, to tackle all of the, conver you know, to rehab all of the conversations we're currently having. Because after three years, two years, the message becomes redundant. And if we keep repeating what we're already saying, uh, I'd, like to, I, you know, I'd like to have the, the, the talent and the intelligent, uh, intelligence on board to uh, make content much more persuasive and effective. So what does that mean, just? Focus on the, uh, on the intelligence. On intelligence? Yes. On the Not intelligence, eh, 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 eh. On the IQ of your audience? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I no, need eighty thousand really, dollars per head. No, no but no, I'm really, I'm, but I'm serious. Let's mm. say I, I would get, I would get the smartest I, sorry, people. Sorry, sorry. Megaphone yeah. has hundreds of thousands of yeah. whatever you call them, followers, viewers, whatever. Yeah. Darish Media has a, a regional 
reach. Mm. Rasif 22 mm. is, I think, read all over the region. Yeah. Let's say you're in those shoes. What, what is different about Polyblock? I would put the right people in one room and I would uh, make sure that we live with a much better, uh, with a much better uh, product. Yeah, and I would hire the smartest people in their respective fields and I would manage that. He's being very vague. No, I think, I th- to me, it, it feels like it makes perfect sense. So it's not a news platform. No. It's still persuasion and opinion. Yes. Okay. It's, uh, it's uh, a shaping public opinion. That's what I would love mm. to do with the right people. Through social media. Yes, narrative. Yeah. Narrative. You are going to be competition. Mm. Or maybe we'll work together. Probably. It's if I got the 80K, we'll surely work together. <laughs> of course, we're working together. 80,000. Uh, are there any more questions yes. before we wrap it up? Yes. One last question. So I'm Nisha Saifa. I'm a journalist. Um, as we mentioned before, I, I recently joined Polyblog. Uh, I'm mainly the pain in the <laughs> Arabic grammar police. <laughs> And I agree with a lot of what uh, George has to say, maybe because, because you are both Virgos, that plays a big yes, role absolutely. in it. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So what made me accept uh, to join to work with Polyblog is the post you uh, talked about earlier, the, the story behind the Karambushaya's shooting and uh, how they had the courage to say what really happened. Uh, my question here is, how far are you willing to go uh, and most importantly, how far are you willing to compromise with your own thoughts in sake of the team's uh, thoughts and the team's uh, spirit? Uh, that's assuming, okay, the question assumes that there is a problem and we have to fix it. No, 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 not, not I mean a current problem. Uh, it assumes you know, the team is too divergent and I would have to find a compromise. Maybe I would sometimes rather, you have different thoughts. Maybe we mm. sometimes we debate, and and that's healthy. So how? Yes, of course, that of course, yeah. of course, of um, course. How far? As long as I'm not going against my own values, and I'm not being a sellout to the causes that I believe in, I'll compromise and I'll I'll talk. And I'm very. I think I'm very happy. Okay. But 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 if we start going against. Uh, uh, the raison d'être of the platform, then what's the point? That's, that's I think, where the... But it's a very loose limit, Yani. I'll, uh, eventually, maybe we'll keep talking about it until I convince you. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. <laughs> so you wouldn't take an opinion that runs contrary to your own? Uh, contrary that's to my own values? Yes, I'm comfortable saying that. No, no I wouldn't publish something you that wouldn't publish. goes against my own values. Let's say somebody who supported uh, Cynthia Zarazir's position on Ziad Barud. Would you be willing to publish that? Uh, uh, no. No. No, I, I mean, I'm, so it still has to I'm match. not unbiased. I'm not in it just to build a, a, a media outlet. I'm an activist uh, on a cause. If you're going to go against my cause, why would I platform you? And then the team would have to reflect that cause too. No, no, I think the team is cohesive as it is. But that's why I said, you no, know, she's assuming that there's something we have. Yani, I wouldn't work with people that I would know I would have to constantly go back and forth with because right. it's just a, a waste of effort. Yeah. I'd rather have a cohesive team and right. be part of a cohesive team. So write Misha whatever you want in Arabic. He won't read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but Misha... He's very good at Arabic. He's surprising me with some vocabulary that's heavy. I use Yamli. I don't know how to use the Arabic keyboard. No, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I want to say that yeah. before Misha, we really, really had an issue with uh, the Ara- with the quality of our Arabic uh, content, and she has brought in, brought it up uh, way up, and which you know, it incentivized us to even bring the English up so that we're on the same, you know, we're on par. Yeah. So she's not a pain in the. <laughs> she's preventing people from being a pain in our. She's preventing pain in. The Please, you know, a me, new question. <laughs> let, 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 let me actually add to that. Yeah. George Verdini tells me the opposite. He will tell me, Lick, Roni, your post is too IQ high. Hot chat GBT will nazilla the fifth grade level. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's George Wazir. No, too. because it takes me five <laughs> attempts to understand Ronnie's cryptic tweets. I feel like sometimes I'm decoding the like you know like yeah. some Morse code. No, so, but you have narrative in mind too, because you want you want the audience to actually literally understand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It has so to I, be accessible. Right. So I take it as a compliment. It's too high. It's too yeah. highfalutin. And that's why you only have ten thousand followers. <laughs> 12,000. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on Twitter too. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any more questions, guys? One more. Leon. Final, final question. Let's find it. I mean, unless there's still anyone. Hi. Hi. I'm Leanne. Uh, I'm British Canadian. I'm a chef. I'm a business owner. And I'm new in Lebanon. Um, what can I do as your friend to support you? Oh wow. <laughs> We've had plenty of those recently. <laughs> me me and anyone else in my position. What can we do to support you? Mm. I'd have to think of that. I'd have to think of it. Uh, can you give me the British passport? <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, it depends on uh, what people's, uh, uh, I usually turn the other question around. If somebody wanted to help, I would ask, what could you do? Like, what are you good at? Are you a really good editor or are you really good at uh, graphic design or are you good at fundraising? It really depends on what the person has to offer. And then, of course, we always have needs, you know, that we need to fill. But I will turn the question around to you and I would ask you, how do you think you can help? The reason he's answering this way is because the truth is he doesn't need it. Oh. No, no. And I mean that. I believe it. Yeah, I mean that. And he's going to change the world. He's changing oh, no. something. <laughs> I, I mean, he's also getting me a new scooter. So the, That's a rental, Ronnie. They won't take it back anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Give me another one. Uh, George Rodini is the kind of person where you're swimming at sunset in Enfi, alone, he comes up, swims right next to you, and tells you the next project he has in mind. That's George Verdini. On his day off, his mind is racing. Uh, every phone call with him, every WhatsApp message, there's some content in mind. And you're able to give a story to people that don't know they have a story. You're able to frame it, shape it. Your talents go well, well beyond politics. I think you could do the same thing in other terrain, and you would excel. Thank you. You're, do you're doing just fine. Thank you. You could also kill him if he becomes competition. <laughs> that would help me. No. So another shout out to Patrick Risha, if he's still here. The best thing... Aside from getting me good seats at every Kateeb event, <laughs> thanks to Patrick Risha, I know George Bertini. It's thanks to him. And thanks to Patrick, I know most of you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, in the last two and a half years since meeting George Bertini, I think I've come to know, really, it's not about competition. It's not about hosting another podcast. It's where the youth is moving. It's to digital content pioneered by artists like yourself. Uh, you're going to be in the Lebanese scene for the rest of your life. Thank you. And it's an honor to have been the first podcast you showed up to. Yeah. I persuaded you to do that. I actually told him in person. He asked if he would be a good host. And I actually thought about it. I was like, you're doing so good as a producer. Why be a host? I think you can be a host if you want to. Thank you. I don't think that's the only thing you should do. You should keep doing what you're doing. Check out Polyblog on Instagram. Wasil Sota. The Happy Hour, which is re resuming another season. I hope so, yep. Poly Talks, which is still happening. Yep. Uh, check out Asseha, which wrapped up its second season. You could check out the two months of Serde George Bardini contributed <laughs> to. And if you want to know more about him, we did an episode on MTV. We've done two episodes on my platform last year. This is the best way to wrap up five years of podcasting. I'm taking a break. I have one more episode with your friend Sarah Al Asmar mm. next week. Mm. It's with John Ashar, mm. who's a stand-up comedian. Oh, nice! Very nice. Good catch. 
He has a interesting political history. Yeah. But his his talent is in humor. Yeah. That's the final episode before taking a break. Yeah. You're so, not getting a break from me, though. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I know any break that if you stay in Lebanon or if you stay on Instagram, you don't like, you don't get a break from George Verdini. But I look forward to seeing you during my break. Thank you. So, round of applause to Samir Bayham. <laughs> the podcast resumes in Alias in September. Haven't decided which week yet. If you have any guests in mind, message me on social media. I'll actually take them into consideration. I've done 500 episodes. I need new names. <laughs> It's the Beirut Banyan on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. George Bardina on Instagram. Polyblog as well. Thanks to everyone, and good night. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>